good morning. Happy New Year's Eve to you all. I, I trust that you are looking forward to an evening where your children will try to stay up till midnight like mine, and they'll fall asleep at 9 o'clock. Um, we're looking forward to, uh, we always have a good time at, at the Broomball House at New Year's Eve, so hopefully you guys will have some good times with family, kind of wrap up this holiday season. Uh, but today we're going to get into something that I hope will be encourage you, that will uplift you, that will challenge you, all of the above. Um, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. That's where we're going to kind of camp out this morning and kind of put a placeholder there for a little bit. Um, i got to set it up with an intro, okay? We've got to talk a little bit about something. So everybody had a great Christmas. Everybody had a great Christmas celebrating the Savior's birth. <laughs> celebrating holidays are great. Celebrating holidays are great. We all get together with family, whether that's good or bad for you. I don't know what that is for you. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a thing where you get together and you're like, let's just make this through to the other side. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to go down, but we need help, Lord. Um, but maybe it's a joyous thing. Maybe it's something that you really enjoy. Um, but also, maybe it's, a, maybe it's a time, maybe you're a little older and your family's grown, grown and they're off doing their own thing. And maybe you're at home by yourself. And the peace and quiet that fills your house on Christmas Day is just beautiful. Okay? Families share all sorts of things at the holidays, right? We, share, we, like, we like Christmas. We like having all these different uh, combined family gatherings and things like that. We share company we have good memory building activities, maybe a special game or maybe a new game that your family started playing. Um, maybe you talk about old stories of Christmases where your crazy uncle went completely unhinged and threw away all the presents because he thought it was trash bags or something, I don't know, something like that, not speaking from experience. Um, we also share sicknesses. That's the great thing about holidays, is we all come together and we all get sick, right? Over break, when you're supposed to be breaking from work or, you know, my wife's home sick right now and, and, and you know, it's kind of one of those things where she's like, I hope I'm ready to go back to work. But she really didn't get a break because she's been sick. And, uh, and then there is the food. The food. Those food items that we've had and Christmas has gone past, um, and it takes us back, maybe even just the simple taste of something, takes us back to our childhood or even, even a moment where we can distinctly remember having sat down at our grandmother's house and tasting that thing for the first time that we've always wanted to have and now it was ours and now we want it every year. That food comes from recipes that are passed down from generation to generation. Those recipes are great, and I, I actually just got something recently in the, in the last six months or so. It's a recipe from um, my great, my mother's going to kill me for this, my great, great grandmother was a baker, and she had a bakery, uh, and she did all kinds of baked goods, pies, cookies, loaves of bread, all different kinds of things. I got some of those recipes. And it's been really interesting to look back at some of those recipes that are, you know, from way back and how they still translate today. And people are like, oh, I wish I could make stuff like they did back then. But those recipes are great if we follow the recipe. If, if we don't follow the recipe, we really start to make a mess, a disgusting mess at that out of things. If we try to add our own flair or pizzazz to it, we might be combining things to the recipe that were never intended or will cause a product to be completely different than what we wanted it to be. I can remember one instance of making banana bread. My mom makes banana bread in a very unique form in a bunt pan, and she coats the bunt pan with sugar, so you get that nice crisp outside crust on it. And I thought, man, it'd be great to add strawberries into the mix. It'd be awesome. Strawberry banana bread. Who wouldn't like that, right? 
So I made it, and my mom was coming to visit, and I'm like, all right, she's going to love this. This is going to be great. I bake it. I flip it over, put it on a pan, start cutting it, and I realize that the strawberries basically turned into slime within the mix. I still gave my mom a piece anyway and said, hey, mom, what do you think? She goes, not my favorite. Don't mean to hurt your feelings, but not my favorite. So I had to do a little research. I had to figure out what the recipe would do to be able to add that in, right? And so I, 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 I tried and tried and tried, but you know what? Nothing beats the original. Nothing beats the original recipe. We can add all kinds of stuff all day that we want to, but nothing beats the original recipe. Today we're going to be talking about the recipe for fulfillment. Recipe for fulfillment. And as we start a new year, tonight into tomorrow, we can use this idea of a recipe to help us on our journey. Not just this upcoming year, but our life's journey as we walk with Jesus. New Year's is always going to be a time where we're going to try to find a surefire way or uh, try to have success or fulfillment in our lives. We try all sorts of ways and avenues that typically end in tragedy or disappointment, only to be repeated the next year in the same exact way. Y'all know what that's the definition for? Insanity. Trying to do the same thing a different way, expecting different results. That's insanity. So let's cut the insanity. Let's try to find a recipe for fulfillment from the scriptures that are gonna help, that's going to help us in our journey of life. What if this year it could actually be different? You've heard that said, right? What if this year could actually be different? What if I keep my gym membership longer than a month? You'd be shocked at how many of those get canceled within a month. What if this year could be the year that I add something to my life that fulfills a purpose or journey that God has for me, for each of us? Here's what I think we all need to take home today and every day, honestly. Fulfillment in life is found only in and with Jesus. Fulfillment in life is found only in and with Jesus. So, Philippians chapter 4. Let's go on a little history journey, shall we? Let's get some context for what we're going to talk about throughout this, this chapter of Philippians 4. Of course, if you've been around the church or you've been around scripture at all, you know the writer of this letter is Paul. And he wrote it to the Philippians, specifically the Philippian church, around A.D. 61 or 62, from prison in Rome, which kind of puts us timeline-wise in the last kind of five years of Paul's life. He's writing to the church of Philippi full of people who are, get this, getting it right. He's not trying to correct them. He's not trying to, like, preach hard at them, fire and brimstone kind of stuff. They're actually doing things right. They're getting things correct. And this wasn't to chastise them or correct behavior, but to show his generosity, show, show them his, his, his encouragement from their generosity, and encourage them on their journey. Remember, he's in bondage. But throughout the whole book of Philippians, actually some people say the whole book of Philippians, the theme is joy. He's writing it from prison. But yet he has so much joy in his heart and seems very happy and encouraged while he's writing this. So, a little history on the Church of Philippi. The Church of Philippi is a church that was the first church in Eastern Europe to be started by Paul in his second missionary journey. Okay, And in the congregation, we have the Lady of Purple herself, Lydia. And we also have, get this, the Philippian jailer, who was saved during Paul's previous bondage. Philippi was a Roman colony. So that, that should give you a little instance of what's going on here. It's in ancient Macedonia, present-day Greece. Okay, It was a city full of retired Roman soldiers and was known for patriotic nationalism. Okay, The teaching that Jesus was... The one true king, while true, would increasingly make it more difficult for Christians, 
especially Christ followers in Philippi, as time goes on. Paul's purpose throughout this letter is to praise them for their faithfulness, their generosity, but also to address issues within the church and encourage believers to keep going in a good direction and to stand strong. Times were about to get tough for these people. Okay? They needed to be strong. They needed, to stabil- they needed a stabilizing force in Jesus that would help them conquer the persecution and the things that would come unraveled around them. And Paul's attitude and tone are caught here as joy-filled and pastoral. He's trying to be kind of a pastor, a shepherd of these people. And Paul knows that these hard times are going to come and wants to give the reminder that the way to be filled with joy and to be fulfilled in this life is to be with Jesus Christ as your Savior. Okay, there's your nutshell of Philippians. Now, what is Paul trying to say to the Philippian church, especially in Philippians chapter 4? And even say to us now as it's passed on through the generations to us. So Philippians chapter 4, we're going to look at verse 1 through verse 9. It says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the way of the Lord, dear friends. I plead with... Please forgive me for names. Yudia, and I plead with Synthike to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you... My true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be, be evident to all, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard it from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the peace of God will be with you. Paul is coming right out of chapter 3 where he talks about our citizenship in heaven. And he talks about this basically because the people in Philippi, again, were patriotic nationalism. They were full of it. okay, And it was so deeply rooted in the city and most likely within the church while trying to call on the people of God to live differently in spite of those things. To live differently because of who they were in relationship with. Not necessarily their their allegiances here on this earth, but their allegiances in heaven. And that Jesus would transform our lowly bodies to glorious bodies with the power that only he can give and controls all things through. Now, he's going to tell us, because of all of that, he's going to tell us what we should be doing because of all that he said. And it kind of breaks down, in in my mind, the way I I look at it, three different parts, okay? Three different parts I want to cover here today as we look at the fulfillment in life being found only in and with Jesus. Number one is this, to stand firm in him, in Christ, okay? Philippians 1 1 to 3, Philippians 4, 1 to 3 says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, You who I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the way of the Lord, dear friends. Standing firm in the Lord means to stay the course. To not let anything distract from the goal for which we are called. He just covered that in Philippians 3, where he talks about in verse 13 and 14, the prize or the aim of the heavenly prize that's ahead of them. Don't let things distract from that goal. Stand firm in it. Standing firm means that I trust and I follow God and I lean on his power and might, not mine. Now, how does he illustrate this? I think it's kind of unique that he kind of illustrates this through two ladies. And I'm not going to say their names again. 
He illustrates this by entreating or encouraging two women in the church who are having a disagreement of sorts. Okay? Notice, we're not told what the disagreement is about. Have we ever had disagreements in church with people? That's kind of par for the course, right? With their people, there are opinions, and where there are opinions, there are disputes. Okay? We don't know if they're arguing about the carpet color, the paint color on the walls. Maybe somebody moved the pulpit, or one wanted hymns, and the other one wanted contemporary music. We have no clue. Okay? Probably none of that. Okay? But we do know that Paul loves and appreciates these, these women enough to call them out on this behavior, and wants them to get things right. Why? Because of their usefulness in the kingdom of God. And more simply, their impact at this local church in Philippi. They need to make things right with each other and with the church so that they can stand firm with one another to encourage one another and to be great representatives of a growing relationship with Jesus. Standing firm in Christ. Not in our own stances and not in our own opinions, but standing firm in Jesus. Standing firm as things turn into chaos and turmoil around us, standing firm in Jesus. So stand firm in Him. The next thing is to rejoice in Him. Verse 4 says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. No, Paul isn't stuttering. He's trying to emphasize this point. He's telling the church in Philippi, and even us, as as we need it sometimes, to be filled with thankfulness and joy. Be filled with thankfulness and joy. Being filled with those, both are fruits of the Spirit. It's it's because of a relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit indwelling in us that those things come out of our lives. And it's a sign that a growing, fruitful relationship is happening within us. Okay? I had a person tell me a long time ago, I was early on in youth ministry, they said, sometimes we, we get it wrong to think that the, the joy of the Lord is something that um, is quiet and uh, controlled. If the joy of the Lord's within us, we have to be joyful. Okay? Joyful, And he said, sometimes we have to tell people, you can be joy-filled with Christ, but you need to tell your face. <laughs> sometimes we look like the grumpiest folk there ever was. Okay? We look hard off. We look grumpy. We look like life is just miserable. Okay? But the joy of the Lord... Actually, in other scriptures, it says the joy of the Lord is our strength. It's something that indwells in us because of our relationship with Jesus and the Holy Spirit indwelling in us that it has no other way of getting out other than showing it. Okay? Showing it. Now, does that mean I want you to go outside and skip to your car and, oh, oh, joyous day when you have a bum knee and it hurts? No, but you can choose to look over your your hurts and your needs at the moment to be joyful to the Lord for the things that he has given you. Being filled with both of these fruits of the Spirit, thankfulness and joy, are a sign, again, of a fruitful relationship that's happening between us and God. It also shifts our focus from ourselves and puts the focus on what God is up to. And how he is operating around us or or through us or in us. We need to take more time more often to be filled with joy. To count our blessings. Meaning that because of what God is doing in my life, no matter the circumstances, that joy that is provided by God can never, listen to me, never be affected. It can never be affected. The joy that the Lord gives to us can never be affected by the circumstances of our life. Yeah, our emotions may run wild. Our our emotions might have control of us at times. But the joy of the Lord is never removed. It's something that's in us and dwells in us and comes out of us. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy 
and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. James 1 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And even Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, but be constant in prayer. So there's a lot that, that God and the scripture has to say about joy and how we, how we have it, how we receive it, how we show it, how it dwells in us. So we need to rejoice. And again, I say rejoice as we live this life. So we need to stand firm in him. We need to rejoice in him. And then we need to live with him. Philippians 4, 5 to 9 we, it's a classic part of scripture where we talk about a bunch of different topics. And Paul hits all of them. Okay, And so I want you to understand this. This is not, this is not Paul is not writing a checklist. He's not writing a to-do list. These are a list of things that are an outpouring of the rest of what we've talked about today. An outpouring of, of more importantly, an outpouring of our relationship with Jesus. Okay? ...and his effect on our lives. In verse 5 it talks about... ...let your gentleness be evident to all. Other translations say reasonableness. And basically reasonableness means gentleness. Let your gentleness be known to everyone... ...because time is short. Don't waste your time... ...being harsh with people. Because it doesn't accomplish anything... ...but drive them away... ...from the person of Jesus says, be gentle with everyone. Let it be known to everyone, because time is fleeting and short. The Lord is coming. It says in that verse, the Lord is at hand. He's coming. And we need to be best, the best representative of him as the world around us is looking to us. Okay? If they see harsh Christians out there, they're not going to want anything to do with the person of Jesus. Because they think... They represent Jesus, and if they're being harsh, I don't want anything to do with that. Oftentimes, there's hot topics that come out or things on the news, and there's always a preacher that speaks up first. And I go, man, why'd they have to say it first? They're kind of nuts. Why can't we get somebody that's solid in the Bible, understands what God is doing, to speak up first? And I always think, man, they beat us to the punch again, right? Because they're well known. There are people that are out there that they just speak and everybody listens, right? But oftentimes they're not based in what God is doing. They're not being gentle. They're not being people that are reasonable with their life. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find, if you do this, you will find rest for your souls. James 3, 17 also kind of says, it says, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, and good fruit. There's that word fruit again. Impartial and sincere. So we want to be gentle with people. We have to go back to the fruits of the Spirit. What's God call us to do? What's God say that will be product of our lives to the people around us? Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, control. Right? Everybody know that song? Gentleness is in there. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's something that is an outpouring of our lives. So Paul is reminding the church of Philippi, and he's even reminding us, be gentle. Let your reasonableness and your gentleness be known to everyone that you interact with. The next thing he mentions is conquering anxiousness. Boy, this is a loaded topic, right? This is a loaded one. It says, don't be anxious about anything. Easier said than done, Paul. But in every situation, by prayer... 
and petition with thanksgiving. Present your requests to God. The ingredients for a life not plagued by anxiety and worry is to hand over the load to someone who is more powerful and says he is there to help us until the end and to do that with gratefulness and thankfulness to him. Did you catch that? To give up the load, instead of bearing the weight of it on your own, instead of bearing the weight of the turmoil around us, giving that to somebody who is able to hold the load, no problem. And to let our requests, anything that pops into our head, to let our requests be known to him, to give it to him first, not last, or not after 40 different attempts by us to handle the situation on our own. It also means instead of us being weighed down by our problems and issues, that we ask for help. Now, I'm a male. And when I go to Lowe's, I still don't know where everything is. But do you think I ask for help? No. Because why? I'm a man. I can find my way around Lowe's. I don't need nobody's help. Okay? I don't need directions, even though I get lost all the time. Now, my phone makes it a lot easier now. I can just plug in a direction, and it'll talk me through everything, right? But the deal is, we don't like to ask for help. And women, you're not off the hook. Uh Uh-uh. No, 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 no. I'm married to a woman. And honey, if you're watching, I forgive me for this. I know how stubborn she can be. Okay? We have to ask for help. That's what he says. He's petition. When we ask God, make your request be known to God. It means that we ask for help. We ask him to intervene. We ask him to be part of the solution. We ask him to be the solution. We don't continue to be weighted down and have the pressures of this world and the problems and issues we face every single day continue to weigh us down to the point of having physical issues because of a spiritual problem. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives to, to, do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. 2 Timothy 1, 7 tells us, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love, And of self-control. Who gave us those things again? God did. We didn't. 1 Peter 5, 7 also says, Casting all of your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. So, gentleness, anxiousness. But then we get a promise. We get a promise from God in this verse. It says, and the peace of God, because of these things, the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we're not talking like, whew, I made it through that. That's peace. I'm I'm at peace now. We're talking about a supernatural peace. A peace that we've never seen on this planet before. A peace that we've never experienced before. A peace that is beyond what we can think or imagine. A peace that each person on the face of the planet is searching desperately for. But somehow, they miss it. That's both in Philippi and today. John 14, 27, again, Jesus is speaking. He says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Okay? Not, not an empty promise or a promise that, that lasts for a little while and then is gone the next day. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid, because I am trustworthy, is what God is saying here. I am trustworthy. And the peace that I give to you will not leave you. It will be with you. John 16, 33, I, I have said these things to you, That in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble. So we have teenagers and kids in the room today. 
Life is hard. Get used to it. Okay? The sooner, the sooner we realize that, the more we can actually accept, okay, this is hard for us, but God is more powerful. God is more able to help us through those things. God is the person that we should turn to and can turn to in our time of trial. It says, but take heart, tail end of that verse, I have overcome the world. Jesus stands in victory. Why do we always choose to sit in defeat? Jesus is in victory. We need to join him there. We need to understand that we are on the winning team. We've been studying Revelation with the teenagers on Sunday mornings in Sunday school. And we've been looking at all the different things and all the different characters and all the different metaphors and all these different crazy things that happen in Revelation. But at the end of the day, we are on the winning team. God's promising his peace through the tribulation, through the trial, through the chaos. And that's a promise he's always willing to keep for any of us at all times. And then Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And it says, because of that, be thankful. Be thankful to God. So, we've talked about gentleness, anxiousness, the promise of God's peace in our life. But then he goes into changing our thinking. Changing our thinking. As time change, as the times change or go on, it's exceedingly harder and harder to focus our minds. There's always something out there that makes a person think through what is true and what's acceptable. But what sifter, what's, what are we straining this stuff through? Are we just letting it all dump in in one place? Or are we sifting out the junk? Are we sifting out the things that aren't going to be great for us? Paul lists a great list. Again, not as a checkoff or not a to-do list, but as a list of if we are in relationship with Jesus and trust him and find, uh, and, and find life and fulfillment in that relationship, we are able to rewire the way we think about things more and more in our minds and compare the world and the scenarios that we go through around us by what he says is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, and worthy of praise. It's not about how we think. It's about how God thinks. How Jesus is getting us to think like him. That's the rewiring process we need. Is to think like Jesus. Now, is this hard? Yes. It's an uphill battle, as they say. For Philippi, people were so sold out on their lifestyle and their countrymen, patriotic nationalism, where their trust was in a system they found themselves in and the profit that is made for them. But this was, was, to, but this was to be different for believers in Jesus. They belonged to a different guild set apart, blessed to live in this world and not of this world. Our allegiances and especially our mindsets, mindsets have to shift so that it's more about the kingdom of God than the kingdom of men. Listen, 2024, unfortunately, I say that very, very seriously, unfortunately is an election year. Don't lose your heads, church. Don't lose your heads. Don't cause friction between believers because of something you believe to be true about a country when it has no effect on the kingdom of God. Please. I saw it take effect too much last election time. Don't lose your heads on an opinion that doesn't matter for the eternity ahead of us it matters for the opinion of now. 
Paul is attacking this in some ways to get that out of their heads in Philippi. And we be do good process to do the same thing. We belong to the kingdom of God. Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to God if we follow and trust in Jesus. Time is short. This country is not going to be around forever. This world won't be around forever. We have to rewire the way we think. We have to think like Jesus would. Romans 8, 5 to 6 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind of the Spirit is life. And there's that word again, peace. Romans 12, 2. Classic scripture. We, we try to talk about this with the youth group all the time. Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. What's renewal mean? Does it happen one time? Or does it happen constantly? Constantly. The renewal of our minds. That by testing, you may know and discern what the will of God is. What is good and acceptable and perfect. And 2 Corinthians 10.5 kind of reiterates... We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And take every thought captive. Every thought that pops into your head. I know how hard that is. I get caught all the time. Every thought has to be captured and processed and understand is it going to be something that's going to please God? Or is it going to be something that goes against what pleases God? I have to rewire my thinking to be like Jesus. To think like he would. And thank God he gave us an example of how he thought. The last part of, of that last portion of scripture is, is a part that's kind of, it's walk it out. It's kind of like that part where Paul says, hey... You know these things, I'm reiterating these things, but now you got to walk it out. you got to see it through to the other side. The nice thing about this life and the life that the Philippians church saw is that they were taught not only the word of God, but they were taught the living word through the examples that were in front of them. It says, whatever you've learned or received or heard in me or seen in me, put into practice. And the peace of God will be with you. This idea that Paul is stating to them seems kind of elementary. Okay? But it is sim as simple as it gets. In, if our relationship with Jesus is growing, becoming stronger, then we have to put into practice what we've heard and what we've seen as an example. Not only through the scriptures, through what Jesus has shown us how to live, but through the example of other people that God has blessed us with in our lives. Who are getting it right. Okay? And I think Paul's reiterating this to them because, listen, he already was with them once. What you've seen in me, put it into practice. Keep doing it, is what he's saying. Keep doing it. Keep after it. Keep on top of it so that you can be an example to the people around you. Especially those who are coming into the faith for the first time. Galatians 2.20 tells us, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 1 Timothy 4.15, practice these things, immerse yourself in them. Man, that's a word, right? Immerse yourself in them. I've seen some kids in this room get immersed into video games. Even some adults. Do we get immersed in the things of God the same way we get immersed in anything else? That's not a judgy statement. I'm just asking a question. 
Because I'm guilty of that too. I don't get as immersed into the things of God as I do maybe Penn State losing yesterday. Bummer. Right? I get immersed in a sports game. But you know what? Do I bring that same energy? Do I bring that same, um, it, you know, diving headfirst in like I do in that stuff to the things of God? Why is it so important that we immerse ourselves in the things of God? It says in the tail end of that verse, so that all may see your progress. They can see your growth. They can see the spirit of God working in you and through you. And they can see the fruits of your labor. They can see what God is doing in you and what God is doing through you to touch other people. James 1, 22 to 25 kind of sums it up for us. It says, but be doers of the word, not hearers only. And if you do that, you're deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but an act, a, a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Because of what God has done and what God is teaching me, there should be something that's happening in my life. Okay? There should be something that I, visibly people can see in the way I interact, the way that I walk, the way that I do things, the way that I talk. And my words and actions. That's a lot. Right? There's a lot jam-packed into the, just those nine verses. There's a lot for us to think through. A lot for us to, to dwell on. But I want to look at just a couple things. How do we respond now? Now that Paul's given us this. He's given the church of Philippi this. And we can learn and glean from it as well. How do we respond? Number one is we need to stop looking for fulfillment in things that don't matter. We got to. The world is plagued by that today. The church is plagued by that today. Not just our church, but the church as a whole. We're plagued by doing things that don't matter. They don't matter. Paul is actually, in, in the gist of everything, he's saying, do, do these things, accomplish these things, and get rid of anything else. Because this is what matters. This is what's positive in your life. This is what God wants you to do in your life. And again, it goes back to our citizenship in heaven. 2 Timothy 2.4, he kind of references soldiers again. And he says to Timothy, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. His aim, our aim in life, goes back to Philippians 3, is to press towards the goal of the upward call of Christ. That's our aim. God's given us our aim. Outside of that, nothing else is positive. Nothing else matters as much as that. Number two, we must find joy and fulfillment in Jesus alone. In what he's done for us, with that thankfulness, with that, with that fulfillment in our hearts. And we must embrace a life with Jesus. With Jesus. Growing, learning, rewiring, and experience him, experiencing him as we walk through this life. So, here's your homework. I always like to say that because I, I can't actually give you homework. Um, but here's what I want you to think through. This is, the, this is the, the take home I want you to think through. What are you chasing after? What is it that's your life pursuit? And what brings you joy and fulfillment? Those, those two things coincide quite a bit, right? The things that we chase after, often the things that we put the most amount of time, effort, heart, and, and effort into, Okay? What are you chasing after and what brings you joy and fulfillment? Identify what that is. Okay? Is what you're chasing after what Jesus would be chasing after? 
okay? Is, is what you're chasing after what Jesus would chase after? Is it something that Jesus would lay down everything and go after? Or is it something that maybe we re really need to rethink why we're chasing after what we're chasing after? Third, because of your relationship with Jesus, what has changed? Right? I, I've actually heard testimonies from teenagers over the years that, hey, I accepted Jesus at camp, but I don't feel any different. I don't really see anything different in my life. I accepted Jesus as my Savior, but nothing's really changed. What has changed in your life because of your relationship with Jesus? What will change because of your relationship with Jesus? And then the question we all need to go through is what needs to change because of our relationship with Jesus? What is it that has changed in our hearts and our lives, the outpouring of what the Spirit is doing in us? Or if there's nothing happening, maybe we need to ask God to work in and through us. And we need to ac accept Jesus as our Savior and start pursuing the things that he wants us to pursue. And then, last, how do we reflect this, our relationship with Jesus, to the people that are around us? How do, we, how do we do that for our families? How do we do that for our friends? How do we do that for the people that we meet every single day? How do we do that to, for people that are younger who look up to us? Or, or, or maybe they're older and, and we look up to them. What, what do we need to do? What, what are the changes? What are the things that we need to do because of our relationship with Jesus? It all hinges off of that. What is the recipe for fulfillment? Fulfillment is only found in the person of Jesus and with the person of Jesus. We have to stand firm in that. We have to rejoice in that. And we have to walk with him through this life. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the challenge that Paul gives to the church of Philippi. Thank you for the lessons that are there. Um, thank you for um, giving us the words that we need to be able to follow. Thank you that you uh, love us, that you care for us. You, you do want the best for us in our lives. But Lord, we have to sometimes get out of your way. We make it very difficult for you to work in and through our lives. So Lord, this morning we ask that you would just help us to... to fall in line, and, and, and to obey what you have for us. But we also ask, Lord, that we would grow not only um, not obeying for you, but we would obey because we're with you. We're living this life, we're living this journey that we're going on with you, alongside. You're there and to comfort us, you're there to, to love us, you're there to walk us through the tough times, the good times, and even the ugly. And Lord, we're thankful for that. We're filled with joy because of that. Help us to stand firm in you. Help us to love you and to rejoice in your name. And help us to walk this all out for others to be able to see in our lives. We ask, Lord, that as we go into a new year, that we wouldn't just come up with a, a mantra or a little slogan for ourselves. But that we would be about the things that you're about. That we would chase after and pursue the things that you've asked us to chase and pursue in our lives. Lord, we ask that you would change us, that you'd help us to rewire the way we think, to think like you, and to be a representative of you even better each day. And we ask this in Jesus' precious name this morning. Amen.